you are loved. Someone, something out there loves you and love exists in all of it. And it's okay not to know, right? It's okay not to know why you feel this way. It's okay not to know where or who to turn to, but just know that there's a lot of people that are out there who maybe you don't know, maybe you do, who are rooting for you, they're cheering for you, and they want the best for you. And so how are you looking at that situation? And it's okay that we don't have to have all of that right now, but you're not gonna find the light if you don't go through the darkness. We all wish to have a positive impact and energetically, it's our responsibility to take ownership of our energy. So listen, men, if you're like, yeah, that all sounds good, but how do I actually do this? How, what are the tools? Come to Sacred Sons Convergence. Go to firetolight.org. I truly believe that this work can shift humanity. Grand Rising Soul Family, Adam Jackson here with another episode of the Sacred Sons podcast. I want to start out by saying thank you. Thank you to the thousands of brothers who have already joined us in this year of 2023. Whether you joined us at an immersion, at an EMX, joined us for online leadership training. Thank you. This world needs us so much right now as men. This world needs the embodiment of the sacred masculine to respond to the chaos that is really all around us. I know when I'm feeling it, that that we're all feeling it. And so sending out gratitude for those of you who are out there doing the work in Sacred Sons, all roads lead to Convergence 8. This year, we will be joining on two continents. Join us for Convergence September 14th through 17th near Edinburgh, Scotland. We're gonna be bringing some Scottish roots. We're gonna be bringing clan and drama. We're going to be bringing some incredible musicians, facilitators, speakers, and of course, all of the brothers who will be joining us, bringing their stories, bringing their culture, bringing their prayers. You know, I really, I really see this convergence as an opportunity for us to do the deep grieving that is a requirement for us in 2023, for us as men to come together and do that grieving work. And October 5th through 8th, Convergence is coming to Los Angeles, California. We are calling in 300 men back to our home in Southern California. If you are interested, please go to sacredsons.com, click on Convergence, and we will see you there. And maybe you saw us also this year at Envision Festival 2023. That's where I met today's guest, Brandon Evans. We had an incredible experience uh, dropping in at Envision Festival. And maybe, Brandon, you could just share, what was that like for you to, to step into a Sacred Sons circle? It was quite special. It was magical. I'd, I'd never heard of Sacred Sons before. I just showed up at Envision Festival. We just moved our family down to Costa Rica for a few months later. Envision came and um, a friend of mine was like, man, you got to come to this thing. So we showed up and uh, yeah, it was really magical. It just kind of, you know, it, it grabbed a special place in my heart. And um, it's really, it's really special and honorable to be in that place with all those men. You know, I've done a lot of work on my own and to see that come together um, to see those open hearts is uh, it's such a beautiful thing and is in such alignment with the work the work that I do and the work that so many of us do. So yeah, man, it just yes. Thank you. Thanks for doing it. <laughs> yes, it was an aligned meeting. So with that, our guest today, he's a father with a decade of firefighting experience. He's battled with his own mental health and transmuted it into mental fitness. He's the man behind firetolight.org, and he is improving how firefighters manage trauma and their mental health. Please welcome Brandon Evans. Awesome. Thank you so much for having <laughs> me here today, Adam. Yeah, Brandon, that, that moment that we met, man, it was so powerful uh, to see you standing there with your, I think then your son was six years old, yeah? Uh, yeah. 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 yeah I'm a six-year-old. Yeah. That that moment, it's it's so powerful. You know, a lot of the who we do this work for is for our sons. Mm. Totally. Yeah. You know, um, you know, it would have been magical to be there with my dad. He wasn't, uh, mm. I don't know how much he's into the festival scene these days, but um, you know, that's why we do it. Right. You know, I want him to just grow into, into this person who he is. And I want to share all of the things that I experience with him. You know what I mean? And, there's time and place for all of those things, but stuff like this, it's just not something to shy away for. So it was, it was, for me, it was special just watching him 
Mm. seeing him be intimidated and shy and like honing in on me, wanting to keep me close when all these things are around, all these men are around and then watching him go to you and walk around the circle with you so that I could be a part of what we were doing. And it was just that instant trust, right? Trusting in another human being. Um, and that look, seeing that look in my eyes to be like, it's okay, kid. Like it's okay. Um, so yeah, it was really cool, man. It was really cool. Yeah. And so, like I said, before we started, this is a, an appropriate time for us to be speaking. It feels like the world is on fire. Wildfires are just like on literally on every continent up there in Canada where you are as well. You know, the Maui fires are still just, you know, 10 days behind us. When you see all of this happening with a decade of, of firefighting experience and with, with your particular story, which we will get into, where do your thoughts go to? When you think about, you know, all of these men who are fighting these fires and all the people being impacted by them. Yeah, you know, um, so I've worked as a professional firefighter for 10 years, and I've also worked as a, a in forestry and we're doing wildfires in British Columbia. So, I mean, I think, you know, as a firefighter, you wear a, a different perspective of looking at these things, having a, a, a bit of a depth of understanding as to as to what it means and having been in those scenes uh helping protect homes when you know fire is impeding on them, being in the bush after fires rip through, setting the forest on fire to try and put out the fire. Um, you know, your hearts just go out because it's like, you know, in one aspect, we've come so far and then, you know, you can't fuck with Mother Nature. So <laughs> these things erupt and they happen and we know how fast conditions can change. And I think there may be a, a lack of not even awareness. You just don't think about it. If you're not in the industry and a forest fire hasn't erupted around your home, you don't think about how fast it might actually be able to change. Um, and so, you know, being one who has gone in, knowing these brothers and sisters who who go into these places um, to literally risk everything that's not in the forefront of our mind. We're just, we're conditioned to do it. We want to help. And so we go to help. And so, you know, your heart just goes to, um, to their families, really. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know what it was like fully for my wife at home all those nights I was on calls or those mornings I came home just crushed and she could see it. And, but you know, she just doesn't get it right. She hasn't, she's not a firefighter. And so, um, yeah, just my heart, my heart's go out, you know, there's so many brave men and women, um, from the top down, like I was just at an international fire chiefs conference in Kansas city, the fire rescue international. I spoke with the U S fire administrator, Dr. Lori, uh, Moore Merrill. Um, she was just in Maui. And so I don't think we always fully understand like people are people and people have hearts and the people at the top, although the bureaucracy and things are super complicated, like we are all working together to do our best to try and help stop the fires, prevent the fires, and just help the people who have been impacted by these things. Um, so yeah, we don't always know that help is out there, <laughs> any of us. Yeah, is there is there kind of like a, maybe it's not a stigma, but is there a sense that there aren't a lot of places to turn to for firefighters or, you know, people that you just, you know, you just can't really understand it unless you're a part of it? I, I think that's part of it, right? I think you can't really understand it if you're not a part of it, you know? I don't know what it's like to be in a war scene in the military. I can relate to what trauma is like and the impact of of of, of being a part of these incredible events that are really horrific. Um, but that specificity of being in the military, I don't know. I know what it's like to be a firefighter. And so, you know... And I've been in that place where you just feel lost, where I've done the hero thing and you feel like not the hero at all. You feel like the exact opposite. Yeah. Say more about that. You know, you've done the yeah, hero sure. thing, but you go home and you're, you're feeling what? Defeated, depleted. You know, I was part of a scene, um, a part of a team where we extracted a woman from a house fire. It was a homicide. She was beaten and burned. Um, so good friends of mine uh you know they were inside the house they were first in they extracted her to the door where we met them at the door took the body outside and this woman's family was on the front uh the front lawn so we walked by them on the way up and we knew that it was a homicide um just before we got on scene just for, through radio communications um and so there's like you know a, a story plays through your head 
for me, that was the first time I saw a body that burnt and you just kind of stand there. You, you really stand there in awe, right? You're like, wow, this is, this has happened. This is really happening. Okay. Yeah. And there's a thousand other things that need to get done that you need to do and be a part of. And so you go and you do your tasks and you take direction and all those things. And then, and then I came home to, um, to a roast chicken dinner. That was, that's what was for dinner that night. And, uh, I remember my wife, my wife was looking at me being like, dude, like the kids are talking to you. Be like, Oh, sorry. Like, yeah. Well, what do you want? Just completely zoned out. Couldn't break that image. And that hung around for, a, for a bit for me. Um, and it just started showing up in other ways, you know, like I found myself a few days later, this was in the middle of COVID. So I had a, a, I used to run a CrossFit gym. We closed the gym after COVID. Like it was not good to us. It was closed for longer than it was open. Um, two years of closures. Right. And so I had all this business stress, financial stress, stress from the gym, just COVID in general. And then my son had walked in the room and I'd, I just, I was yelling and swearing at him. You know what I mean? He'd knock something over. I'd turn him like, what the fuck are you doing? And the words just kind of bounced right back at me. You know, so in these moments, it just felt hopeless. I didn't know what to do. And then it's coming out sideways. This is a the big thing for men when we when we don't have an outlet for it. It comes out sideways, typically around the the, the ones we love the most, right? Totally. You know, and um, I know I knew I wasn't good. I knew there was a lot of things I was trying to juggle, and there was just so much that I was fighting that I didn't have control of. And I wasn't in acceptance of that yet. And so, you know, those words bounce back at me. I wrote a poem called the hero sorrow. And it was like, you know, you show up, you do all these incredible things. The public perceives them as incredible acts, but you just feel hollow. You feel empty inside. Like, man, this is fucked up. And I don't know what to do about it. I don't know where to turn to it. And I'm not thinking about what my, what my fire department is, is willing to offer me. I'm just kind of feeling like, man, like I gotta, I gotta try to show up, but I don't know how to show up right now. And I was very fortunate that I had support, right? My wife turned to me, she said, you need to get some help. And so I got, for me, it was getting back on that train um, and stepping up and being like, you know, I'm here to be the best for my kids and, and be an example. And I wasn't proud of what I did, but it happened and it is what it is. And so what do I do? I can tell them not to do it. Right. I can, in one hand, be a hypocrite and do as I say, not as I do, or I can step up and my kids have seen me sobbing on the couch. They put their hands on me. Uh, it scared them at times, um, but they, they're, they're, along, they're along with us in the journey and we don't hide anything from them, what we do. And they're so much a part of our life and they're a part of our healing process and our healing journey. So they they were with us going through those dark days and they were with us as we climbed out and as we came up and as I rose up and, and as I found acceptance and love in the horror and tragedies that existed there. So through the healing, learning to shift that perspective to appreciate the heroism that exists, right? We just say, no, I don't want it. I don't want to receive it. Nope. Not me, not me. And you know, on one hand, maybe that's okay. But on another hand, it's like, we do special things and we need to learn to appreciate, to be special. And yeah. And to receive, I think, he, I think you nailed it to learn how to receive because what it, what it's feeling like is it's like, it's such a demand both on the psyche and probably physically on the body. And so maybe those words of affirmation aren't necessarily the medicine that you need in the moment, but to receive just like a microdose of it, like let it come in, let the appreciation come in so that you know why you're that, that, that what you're doing matters. So yeah. What would you say from here for maybe someone who's in it and regardless of what state or what the trauma is that they're in, but from the other side of the tunnel, like I'm hearing, like there's a light on the other side. Mm, like yeah. what would you say to someone who's, who's currently in it about like, about just that fact that there, that there is hope. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's like, I mean, the first thing is like, you are loved, right? Someone, something out there loves you and, and love exists in all of it. And it's okay not to know, right? It's okay not to know why you feel this way. It's okay not to know where or who to turn to. Uh, but just know that there's a lot of people that are out there 
who maybe you don't know, maybe you do, who are rooting for you, they're cheering for you, and they want the best for you. And so as, as firefighters, like we're really good at going into the unknown, at taking like extraordinary risks. We're just not so good at doing it internally, right? We're not so good at turning inward to say, whoa, and facing our own humility to be like, wow, this happened. Wow, I did that. Wow, I reacted that way. Wow, like this is what I'm turning to and facing that reality. We know in the fire service, like substance abuse and alcoholism, it's not a small number. It's a big number. And so by facing those humilities, we actually become better. For me, I couldn't shake this deep, dark image. And then I tried something that was a little bit different, right? For me, it was NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, mixed with a breathwork session. Uh, these things kind of just happened at the same time. I didn't schedule it. I didn't plan it. One was already pre-booked. One just popped up out of nowhere. And, you know, it's how it works, right? And for some reason, this I'm crying on the table doing this breathwork session. And this image is in my head of this house fire, this woman. And then the fire shifts into the sky, into this like beautiful sunset. And like our souls, this woman and myself collide together. And I just had my own image of what she was or maybe what, what she looked like and our shadow or our, our souls collide. And I was like, Oh man, you know, like maybe my role here or why this happened to me was to like see the love in this really horrible situation. Like her kids were on the front lawn. They were visibly upset. We saw pumpkins in her garden decaying. This happened in the winter. So she had put the pumpkins to decay in her garden to give nutrients back to her garden. That's love right? There's love there. And so for me, it was the shift of, huh, where, where, where isn't love? And I haven't found a place yet where it doesn't exist, right? Really horrible things happen sometimes and it, it sucks. Um, but we're not taught to be in the cessation of suffering. And so if we can be in it, if we can learn that this too shall pass, that means that something will change and something is going to come from what we've experienced and we can be in the darkness of it or we can look to find the light. You know, Stephen Hawking's found light in the darkest matter that we currently know in our universe in the black hole. It's called Hawking's radiation, right? It's so dense. Nothing's in there. Wait a minute. There's radiation. Wait a minute. That's light. Wow. Money. It's such like this metaphor of life. Like, how are you looking at that situation? And it's okay that we don't have to have all of that right now, but you're not going to find the light if you don't go through the darkness. If you just stand on the edge, then the shadows keep coming. Once you start to face them, things change. And it's like, it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done, <laughs> right? It's not easy, you know, facing all of these things, realizing all these traumas that have happened, knowing there's going to be more to come. I don't know what, but there's more life to happen. So there's a lot of loss coming from all of us. I just wanted to add, I love the piece that you said there, you know, find the love in the situation. If, if it's hard for you to find the love in the situation, maybe even to find the gratitude, you know, can we find the gratitude even in the darkest places? Like we can be gratitude for the, the little small pieces of light. That's a great like baby step in any situation and, and the acknowledgement of that. It's like that atomic habits, right? One, one percent. That's it. One percent. Find your one percent today. And yeah. that I did a psilocybin ceremony as part of my healing a few months later. And you know, this shaman that I worked with was quite a quite a special human being. And we had this conversation around love. And he was like, you know, going through the practice of showing things love, like in your own head. You're not talking out loud, like uh, you know, maybe you're a crazy person, but oh, I love computer. Why? Well, look at all the magical things that it does for me. I love lamp, right? I love lamp. Why? Because it gives me light so I can see at night when I wake up and it's dark. And so by picking all of these inanimate objects, this was a practice that I did consistently. I still do it today. And it's like, it, for me, it was one of the most powerful tools because you're wherever you are, not like you're at something or you're at nothing or you're at a percentage point. You just are where you are. And if that place isn't good, then telling the doorknob that I love you might sound silly, but no one else needs to hear it. Telling 
your partner or your parent that you love them, that's actually a really hard thing for a lot of people to do. And so you just pick something easy. I can't talk back to you, can't give you attitude, can't express any kind of emotion. And then the gratitude builds and the love builds. And over time, you have this foundation to build off of. Yeah, come take a, a barefoot step outside away from the inanimate objects and to just look at a tree, notice the the bloomings, you know, notice the season change. That's a big one for me to just like take the time to notice. Take the time to notice those things and to to have appreciation for them, for the ability to to perceive it. This is all great. And I wanted to say this too, you know, as you're saying this, there's a part of me who's thinking of a guy on the other side listening. Well, yeah, I don't I don't know where I go for a breathwork session mixed with NLP or you, know, you did the the rapid eye movement. Is that what you said? I've done that, yeah. 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 Yeah, the MRI. Right. It's like I don't know a place that that can hold what I have. And that's why organizations like Sacred Sons exist. This is why totally fire to light exists. Is to create those spaces, yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, there's there's so many safety nets and the beautiful thing, um, I don't know exactly how old you are, but we probably come from the same era. Forty three. So, I was born in nineteen eighty. Okay, right. So I mean I'm eighty four. So you know, Google didn't exist. There was no Google. <laughs> yeah. right? You had this like floppy disk encyclopedia you had to shove into a computer if your family had a computer or you had to go to those things called libraries to do some research. So we have this a tool that we're actually quite talented at using nowadays on our phone and you just punch it in um, and Instagram, reach out, sacred sons, boom, reach out, fire to light. We're here. Let us know. Talk to your brothers. Talking is huge. And if you can't talk to your brothers, to your sisters, to your loved ones, to your family, there's a million hotlines that exist that we can pick up and call. There's churches you can walk into that have no judgment on religion, that you can just go and talk to someone. You don't even have to see them if you don't want to. And so there's, it's courage, right? We need to develop the courage to help ourselves. You know, we're, we're taught that like, Selfishness is a bad thing, and it means arrogance if we're selfish. And so we've lost the art of being selfish. We've lost it. We say, hey, must be nice that you get to go for massage at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm busy working. So we place this judgment. Whereas you need to be selfish. You need to take care of yourself and be your best you so that you can be your best father, your best husband, your best son, daughter, so you can be the best version of yourself. So you can help yourself and then you can help others. We think we have to put everybody else before us and then we sacrifice us. Yeah. Let's talk about that sentiment. This is perfect, especially with your background. What inspired you to become a firefighter in the first place? I got to believe there's a little bit of that sentiment of like, I'm going to take care of everybody else in order to to not look at myself. You know, we, you said that a little sure. bit. You spoke to that a little bit. Is that... um? I believe this is an ailment that a lot of men have. We're looking for usefulness. We're looking to be purposeful. It's interesting how you how you phrase that because, like you know, you know, I was definitely when I when I decided that I was going to take this path. I'd also decided that I wasn't smart enough to go to university. I wasn't smart enough to choose something else because my grades in high school told me that, and now. Like I just basically wrote a master's degree, a 70 page report on, on that eight months of research that I just did, that I've just done. You know, I got called a nerd the other day. I was like, wow, I totally <laughs> I've never been called that before, you know? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's funny. Like I'm just, this, you know, this, the awareness of this now is like, this has come in when I was a, when I was a kid, my best friend's dad growing up was a firefighter. And then I met my wife in high school. Um, and her dad, um, one of my greatest inspirations in life, uh, was also a firefighter. And my dad uh, ran an insurance brokerage with his brothers. And I remember being a little boy, him always um, drawing on notepads at our at our family cottage, you know, and him wanting to turn that into something magical. And he he would tell us that, you know, ah, if I could do it again, maybe I'd be an architect. 
He wasn't doing what he was, what he wanted to do. He was doing what he needed to do to raise four boys and keep us all fed and clothes on our backs and, and allow us to play hockey. So I knew I liked working with my hands. And I watched my father and my grandfather build community and be a part of community through hockey, through their business downtown. And it was just who they were. Everyone was always welcome at our house, was always welcome at the cottage. Didn't matter what it was, didn't matter what struggles the family may or may not have been going through. Like everyone was welcome. He, you know, my parents lived that model of build a bigger table, not a bigger fence. And that just become embedded in us. So, you know, as a seven-year-old boy, the same age as my son is, driving to hockey practice at 5 a.m. And there's a man laying in the bank, uh, the doorway in the bank, a homeless man. And my dad stops the car, gets out of the car, gets him up, goes across the street, grabs him a coffee in the coffee shop that's open, gets him a sandwich, comes back in the car, no words, and we just drive to the hockey rink. That's normal to me. Those things, being of service is normal. And so for me, it was easy going into firefighting. I was like, I want to work with my hands. And when I look at what my father, his relationship with his work versus my best friend and my wife's father's, their relationships to work, they love going to work. They love their job. They always talked about their job. It was exciting. I was like, yeah, I, I'm down. <laughs> I'm in for that not sitting at a desk. And so that's what guided me into, into the fire service. Mm. I love that story about your father. And I want to say here, like, what does a world look like with more random acts of kindness? That's such <laughs> simple medicine, but even for you as a, as a small boy to see that, to see like, the, just like a simple act of kindness, uh, of generosity, Gosh, the world could use more of that. We're in, we're in this digital age where there's, I'd say there's, there's like wildfires on the internet. You know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there's just so many unconscious acts of aggression, you know, that are, that are happening within humanity in this, in this cesspool on the internet. There's a lot of love there too. Don't get me wrong. There's definitely places mm -hmm. to find love, sure. but bringing that kindness to the real world, like through, through our actions. I, yeah. I imagine, you know, that's a, that's a part of it too, like to help build the soul back up, like, like finding spaces for kindness. Yeah, man, we got to contribute, right? We got to contribute, you know, like, uh, holding a door open for someone changes, it changes their day. And in some cases it changes people's lives. You know, industry, we are constantly trying to, um, collect data. Because data is information and we can make decisions from that. It's wonderful. But there's so much data we'll never know. We'll never know that you didn't go home and kill yourself because someone held the door open for you. And that small act changed <sighs> someone's entire trajectory of their life. And that happens yes. every single day. Every day. And so the awareness around what you're talking about, the kindness of strangers. What are we taught, dude? What do we teach our kids? Don't talk to strangers. It's the stupidest fucking thing we can be teaching our children. No offense if that's what you do, but I'm sorry. It is what it is. You know, like there's so much beauty in strangers. Strangers have completely changed my life, completely changed my life at so many times. And now those strangers are some of my best friends that I've ever met. <laughs> We were, we were all once strangers. You know what I'm saying? We're, we are all strangers in this strange earth. That's, that is such a beautiful sentiment that you just shared. Now they're some of the best friends. Wow. Now they're on this life journey together with us. I love that, that sentiment of talk to strangers. We pump so much fear into our children. Um, because of, because of misunderstanding. Yeah. You know. We've lost ourselves, right? We, we've lost our souls and, and our souls there, right? It's articulating and saying, Hey, like I'm channeling spirit and here I am. And it's manifesting in this body, in this life. And the mind is there, but you don't have to listen to it. I'm also here. And we don't know the language. We've lost the, the language. Um, and it comes in little belts. Um, but we need to get back to that and add to the collective intentionally 
and grow our awareness around positivity and get away from negativity. I don't know what stats are like and who does or doesn't watch the news these days, but like what news are you watching? It isn't about watching the news and being aware of what's happening in the world. Like what messaging do you want to bring into your life? Is it negative? Is it positive? I'd say it's even a step beyond what news are you watching? It's how are you feeling as you watch it? What frequency are you perpetuating from the act of watching this news? And that goes for for all of it, for the doom scrolling or for the video games or the YouTube. I'm like, I'm for these things as tools. And we have to do, we have to use them with some amount of consciousness. Otherwise, they become a virus that just takes over. You know, so totally it's right. a big projection, but that's that's basically what it feels like is happening is people become consumed by the thing that they're watching and it shifts their their actual frequency or vibration that they walk with. And that that's the only thing that's actually real. That's the actually that's the thing that that matters. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's what matters. We've um, I don't think enough of us know ourselves as much as we think we might know ourselves. Most of us live our entire lives around family and friends that we've grown with, who we're comfortable and confident with. And that's a beautiful thing. But very seldom do we ever step away from that to say, what decisions would I actually make? Mm. Right? Think about being a teenager and you go to a party and none of your friends are there and you're all on your own. And someone's saying, hey, do you want to drink this? Hey, do you want to smoke this? Hey, do you want to do this? You want to try this? Do you want to come with us? You're going to say yes, or you're going to say no without influence from your peers, only the influence of strangers. And so we don't always know how we would react to that thing. So a beautiful thing about firefighting is that when we come back from a major incident, we debrief. We say, okay, what do we do? And why do we do it? And a lot of times the, the answer is, I don't know why I did it, but this is the decision that I made. And so what happens often is we beat ourselves up over that. This happens outside of firefighting in life. But we take a look back to try to learn from our past to move forward. So the next time we're more prepared to make a different decision, again, in a completely unknown scenario. And so I may deep believer uh, in the, the beauty of meditation and meditating because we get to spend time on our own in observation of our own thoughts, feelings, and emotions. So deep practice that through time we learn to understand this. Going for a walk in nature by yourself. Going on a vacation by yourself to learn who you are because it's easy to do things with someone else, but we become so detached from who we are because we don't spend enough time with who we are. We spend time with who we think we are or how we think we must be based on someone else's assumption of how my life should be and how my life should be dictated and the decisions that I should make based on your fears, not my fears. And so we don't know. And this is how most of us live our life, live like that for a long time. Before we said, whoa, 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 put the brakes on. We could live those dreams. We could do those things. We could act on the decisions that we want to act on. And we don't have to listen to someone else's fears around those decisions. I'd say some of the biggest growth steps in my life have been from solo travel, for sure. Mm -hmm. And like exploring and going to temples and learning new cultures and through transformational gatherings. Like I'm saying, we, we met at Envision. There are spaces that are designed for ascension, for the ability to level up, for the ability to tap into infinite love and to feel it from stranger to stranger and to feel it in all of our relations, not just to pray for it to come as if it's something that's not already here, but to be right. immersed fully in it. Mm -hmm. Those experiences are they're priceless for one but they're 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 designed to fulfill that part of the hero's journey to fulfill that part of the human journey to discover who we truly are i love this this prompt or this question if resources were unlimited and love was infinitely abundant what would you do 
you know, you, what, what, is, what does it even feel like to think about that? What if resources were absolutely unlimited and love was infinitely abundant? What would you do? What would you do with your life? How would you act? And even though, let me ask you, what would you do? <laughs> Not to sound uh, arrogant or whatever, but like I'm doing it. Like, yes, I'm, that's I'm what I'm talking about. It, you know? like, we, we sold our house. We moved to a new country to try something different with our children. Um, we, we sold all of our stuff. We got rid of it all. Uh, we moved the family down to Costa Rica and said, let's just try. And it was extremely uh, terrifying and scary and, and abundantly beautiful all at the same time. And um, and we said we wanted to live summer. And now we're back in Canada enjoying this beautiful Ontario summers. And in a week's time, we'll be back in the jungle in Costa Rica and open to whatever it is to come next, whatever feels right. And if it, we're not, if it's not working out, then we'll move on to the next to the next thing, you know, um, money comes and goes, it's just money. And so if someone dropped $10 million in your bank account today, you probably don't know what you do with it or know how to deal with it. And it might be gone before you know it. Um, or you might be able to do beautiful things with it. The reality is it might change your emotions for a little bit, but not for the long term. Yeah. Yeah. I think the reality is do beautiful things anyways <laughs> and the, totally. the more beautiful things that we participate in the more abundant our lives become the more we feel it the more we attract more of it you know the financial piece is it's put on a pedestal uh, because of the nature of the capitalist society that we live in but it's not it's not everything it's not even it's interesting to say this in a space of like men's work but i think collectively we have to reframe our priorities just like, let me say it that way. Yeah. You know? And <laughs> yeah. so what if the priorities are the, are things like the mental health and wellness of our children, of our people, of each other? Like, what if we, what if we make that the priority? How does that shift things? I would say it's going to shift things for the positive. Totally. How can it not? Yeah. And so how do we each do that for ourselves individually, right? How do we take that step? And it's not, we don't have to invite every family to risk it all and move to Costa Rica. That's, that's a journey, right? My brother, Neil Christensen, they're, they're down in Panama, do live in the dream as well. And we can, we can start to invite that energy in. I think by the way you, you eloquently put it, find the gratitude for the small things, find the love, start finding the love and build from that place. It's hard to recognize, you know, when we hear these phrases, whether it comes from Buddha or Jesus or whoever, like, you know, everything you have is already here. That's what it means, right? They say that the, um, the monk walks the same path every day for their entire life in the act of always searching for something different. Oh, look, that flower blossomed today. Oh, that stone's turned over today. So how do we articulate that in our own life? Because if you drive the same route to work every single day, there's different people in those cars. Maybe you frequently see the same ones, but they're not always beside you in the exact same spot. So the subtle shifts in energy, in space, in material, in the non-physical, the sudden changes always. Our atoms are always moving protons and neutrons, they don't stop moving. You are always in motion, always changing every single day. And so the beauty of life, the love, it's there. It's all there existing. And so how do you want to exist with it and in it? Shit will happen. That's, that's real. That is real. And you have a beautiful opportunity and choice to learn how to Right? We always say, oh, you have the choice to so make the right decision. No, we have to learn how to make the right decisions. We have to learn through a long process of how to react differently to anything that happens to us when we're so used to reacting and acting in a very specific manner because habits are built. And so we got to do the effort. If you're not happy with an area of your life, you got to do the work to change it. Nothing or anyone or any amount of money will ever change that for you. And so we got to work on those small shifts. 
work on those small changes and it's work. That's it. It's work, man. Like it's, it is fucking work. And if you ain't willing to work, it's relational work. And it's, it's, it's almost criminal that like they've eradicated relational work from like the school system. You know, we learn all the, we learn all the transactional pieces and absolutely zero of the relational things like relationships are what life is all about. And we don't get the opportunities to train in them, to learn how to, how do we end a relationship cordially? That'd be a great class for every single person on earth. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just like who, there's, I'm sure there's the the ones who got with their high school sweethearts or whatever. Most of us have been through breakups and they're hurt and, and we've acted and reacted in ways that we wish we hadn't. You know, what about a class on, on that, the conscious uncoupling, right? Bring the, bring these things in early for, for people to, to get the, the training wheels, so to speak. Because now here we are, we're out here in this time on this planet. We are the adults in the room, Brandon, you and I were of the same generation. And what are we going to do with it? Are we going to pass the buck on to the next generation the way it seemingly has been passed to us? Are we going to stand up and say, hey, no, these things are important. Like I'm standing here as a sacred son, calling men into convergence, calling men into community to say like, hey, brothers, you're not alone. You're not fucking crazy. You're not toxic. Calling you in. Yes, we have to do the work. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, it's going to be fucking amazing. <laughs> yes, you're going to be a, a transformed version of yourself. There is that uh, reality as well. It's like, are you willing to step into a space like that? If you were to invite a brother, say there's someone out there listening, he's like, fuck, Brandon, I resonate with you so much. Maybe he was a firefighter as well or someone in that, in that industry, how would you call them into fire to light? How would you call them into working with you? Yeah. You know, this is stuff we're working on right now. You know, it's, um, it's okay not to be okay. And we're here to help. I've been in your shoes. I think that's the biggest thing in the fire service. Like I've, I've worn, I wear the boots. I know what the boots feel like. I know how they fit. I know how sloppy they get. Uh, I know how rough they are. I know how they can penetrate every conceivable aspect of my being, my emotions, mentally, physically, all of it. I know how it comes out in my negative reactions towards my children. I know, I get it. I've been there and it's okay. And, and we can help guide you and direct you um, and start taking the steps. And we're here all the way along the way. And, you know, it's just like the fire. You got to go in, you got to face it in order to put water on it. We can't always just put water on it from the outside. You got to go into it. You got to find the fire in order to put it out. And we're here to help. Go through the fire in order to feel the light. You know, what would your son say? What would your son say about you after, you know, this, this journey you've been on and the transformation? I, I hear the, the sorrow in that piece, but do you feel like you've been able to show up in, in action as a father? Do you feel like this has transformed you as a parent? This, the deep inner oh, yeah. work that you've done? Oh yeah, I do. It's a constant, right? And which is a beautiful thing. You know, there is no end. I get to work on being better for my children. <laughs> there is no day. end. It's all day, every day, isn't it? Yeah, that's <laughs> it, right? And it's like, it's beautiful. And so I get to, I get to be here doing this um, for them, really, right? Every single day. And I get to understand them better um, to show up. So I hope at some point, um, I don't hear him say anything. I just get to see him. I just get to, I don't need a thank you from him. I just, I just, I just love him and I love my daughter and I want them to be amazing. You know, my son, he asked me to, to play all the time. Come play Lego dinosaurs, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. So we get to do those things. We exercise together. He pushes me. He wakes my ass up in the morning to work out with him together. And my daughter, like, come cuddle with me, daddy. Come read with me. And her and I, we, we do this. And so <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, I look at it like, oh my God, this is so difficult. It's so hard. But the reality is like, wow, this is beautiful. I get, I got, I got work here and uh, she's pushing me to, to do the work every day. And, um, and so, you know, at the end of the night, um, I get to read to my kids and cuddle with them. And yeah. it's the biggest in, blessing. In love. Mm. I, that's what I'm saying. It's like the, the best part of my day, either going to bed, putting the kids to bed or waking up with them when, you know, just that, those moments of, of just blissed out 
love with uh, between the parents and their children and just just being in the in the gratitude of it all. Just, you know, I can't I can't really go anywhere else in with it. It's, it's just like it's the greatest form of love to experience as a human being. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's so it's so magical. And so, and so, and so there, there, that's the why it's fucking worth it. Yeah. It's worth it for those moments. It's worth, <laughs> worth it. You know, it's it, it's worth it. It's worth it for them to experience the fullness of of love as a human that they can, so that they can pass it on. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's really that's really how we how we pass this work on, right? Totally. Yeah. Well, yeah. We get we get it. You do the work and you pass it on and continue to learn about acceptance, right? Because they're going to do something that goes against my grain and I need to be in acceptance of that. I felt like my, my, my dad specifically, right. Wasn't for a long time. And then I'm a couple of years ago. So I'm 36, 37 years old, waking my dad up at six o'clock in the morning to get in the canoe, to paddle for an hour down a lake so that I can jump in it and spend the next two hours swimming in open waters from the length of the lake with him by my side for for safety so that I don't get hurt by another boat. And as I'm swimming, I'm there, I, just, I look up and I see this beautiful silhouette of my dad in his canoe with the sun rising, mist on the water. And I'm like crying as I'm swimming, just being like, yo, he's always supported me, right? Whether I realize it or not, he's always been there. Um, and I'm so grateful for that, that that's instilled in me with my children. You know, I get to do something different. Maybe it isn't, accessible or normal to everybody by packing up and moving uh, to Central America. Um, but I get to watch my kids do all these things. And at some point, hopefully they'll know that I support them, that they can come to me with really hard decisions, knowing that mom and dad will be there to be like, it's okay, we got you. Regardless if I agree with you or not, I got you. All I can do is share some wisdom and I want you to challenge me. I want you to tell me your why. And, and, and I got you because we love you and just see how it goes. So it's uh, life is funny. We always, we always put whatever perspective our current energy has. And if we learn to shift that energy a little bit, we might find a new perspective <laughs> and it may serve us a lot better than where we currently are. Yeah, we certainly uh, can save ourselves some unnecessary suffering and those around us. I think that's a, that's a big part is like, what is the impact ultimately that we're having? I think we all wish to have a positive impact and energetically it's our responsibility to like, to take ownership of our energy in the ways that we can. So, so listen, men, if you're like, yeah, that's not, that all sounds good, but how do I actually do this? How, what are the tools come to sacred sons convergence, go to fire to light.org. This is why these organizations exist. You know, I spend a lot of time um, reiterating like the importance of this work. I, I truly believe that this work can shift humanity. You know, a lot of the situations that we are in geopolitically, environmentally are because of the decisions of men. What happens when men who are making these decisions operate from their heart space? Come from a space of love and gratitude, like what you're hearing Brandon come from. You know, someone who's been it, who's been through the fire and has done the work to come out on the other side. It's beautiful, man. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's a lot of beautiful things happening in the world, right? We talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, our gender, all these things, all these beautiful things are, are, are rising and coming, coming to the surface. Uh, it's forcing a lot of acceptance in areas that there never was acceptance before. Um, but I mean, you, you nailed it, right? Like we're men. And we're products of the ancestry of men. Um, this is a theme in my research paper from interviewing over 100 fire chiefs on five different continents. Over 90% of those chiefs were men. Still making the decisions from a place of men. And so how are we making those decisions? We exist. It is not a fault from where we have come from. It is simply a process of evolution that this is where we are now it may not have been acceptable before as a man to open your heart so much but few were right few were and so we are standing on the shoulders of all of these giants that have come before us 
And it is our duty as men to open those hearts and shout loud and proud and teach our sons what it means to feel those emotions. Dude, like I gravitated so quickly into Sacred Sons. I came out on day one, boom, I was there every day. I was that <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. How can, you, how can you not, you know? And when I look at my second home, that's the fire hall, because I spent so much time there. When I look at that second home as a firefighter, those numbers are the same. Still 90% male. We don't have a female on our crew. So we're 100% male on my speci- in my specific fire hall on my ship when I'm in there. All beautiful things, all wonderful things. And the work's happening a little bit. The awareness and recognition of the work needs to grow massively. It's like, oh, I am doing it. Right? I think, I don't know if it's a case of you are or you aren't doing it. Are you recognizing where you are doing it and allow that to build into other areas? I exercise often, I surf, I get to the beach, I hang with my kids all the time. I do a lot of things. I eat super clean. I haven't drank alcohol in three years. I don't do drugs, none of it. I just like, people ask me, oh, how do you have fun? I'm like, man, this is a process, <laughs> the evolution. This didn't happen all at once. This has happened over the last 25, 30 years of my life. It's happened over the last 40 years of my life. It's from day one. We learn how these things build and grow. And to your, to your earlier point, you haven't arrived anywhere. It's always day one. You know what I'm saying? Day one, man. It's always always day one. And we, we always always have that sunrise, that sun to come up and remind us like, Hey, new opportunity. You're filled with life force energy. What are you going to do with it? Like every day is an opportunity. It's like such a massive opportunity. I love that about being human, this experience, like every day is truly an opportunity. Doesn't mean you got to turn it all around. Doesn't have, doesn't mean you got to be the hero. It's just those little small acts, those little, the smallest bits, like focus on those. I really, that's what I'm taking away from this situation is just like how impactful that moment when you just think of someone else to, to not be selfish or selfless, but to be of service and to watch that ripple like out into the lives and then back into your heart. Yeah, man. You know, it's, um, we get one shot, mm. right? And if we had like, if we've lived a hundred lives, I don't know. I'm, I'm not like recognizing them or being in all of them right now. So <laughs> in this moment, right? In this moment, it's like, I got one. I got yeah. one. And if they're and recognizing you, know, you or if our ancestors are watching us, no doubt yeah, yeah. they're rooting us on, man. They're, the ancestors oh, yeah. are rooting for you. They're like, yes, we preserved and passed on to you life so that you can take this life and, and continue and to continue to pass on the love, the love that created us. You know, it's my son, Noah, he, he sometimes he drops these brilliant teachings on me. Maybe, maybe your children do as well. I have three boys and then we have, uh, we have another beautiful soul on the way. So I'm soon to be a father of four, but Noah asked me, he's like, how many people are on earth? And my answer, of course, was 8 billion. Cause that's what I've been told by, you know, the, the, the sources I've been told by that's like a typical adult response. And he goes, no, he goes, there's infinite people. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, he's like, well, there's a baby coming in. He's like, and so like, there's always new people coming in. He's like, so how could you count to a number? You know, and I'm like, I'm like just contemplating, like, oh man, there is an infinite cycle of humans that's always coming through. And regardless of what the the number is, there's never a number. He's absolutely right. Never. <laughs> there's that's never amazing. like a that's number amazing. of people that there are on the planet. It's in an infinite loop <laughs> of souls yeah. com- uh, coming into this life and departing. And I sat with that just to the the thing that I was left with was one, his brilliance. And two, how change is inevitable and it's always moving and this life is always moving. And with that awareness that we do have our one, our one shot, the invitation to do something beautiful with it. Yeah. And, and, you know, what we don't know is when or how uh, that, that time is going to expire, right? We don't know when our death is going to come um, or how it will come. And, and so if every day isn't new, and you don't treat every day as new and you don't take some kind of actionable step to move forward, then it's going to remain the same. 
and we're going to constantly be in this loop, right? That cycle of definition, doing the same thing over and over again, or the definition of insanity, right? Same thing over and over again, looking for a different result. We're just going to be in that loop all the time, not realizing that everything else around us is changing. It's changing and we're changing, right? Maybe we're going deeper into depression or with our anger or anxiety or whatever, opposed to trying to crawl out of it. You know, it takes years for a human to learn how to walk efficiently and effectively. Mm. We don't think about it. We don't remember it as an adult. He's like, yeah, I can walk. Um, but it took a lot. It took a lot to get there without anger and frustration. And so, you know, we just got to embrace being human and like, Things change, and why wouldn't you do the thing you want to do? We all, we, we're masterful. We're masters of excuses. Masters of excuses. And most of them are absolutely, they're meaningless. They mean nothing. There's just fear. We're just scared because we've never contemplated our death. We never considered it. We never studied it. We never think about it. We just fear it. As opposed to allowing that to fuel our life. So in the book of the Bardo, the book of the dead, that's a Buddhist text, right? And they say, they talk about in the book, the last thought that you have carries into the afterlife. So it's irrelevant whether you believe in, in a life after this one or not in, in, an, in a non-physical space. It's irrelevant. But what do you want your last thought to be? And how is that going to change your life now to live up to that last thought? Yeah. It's beautiful, man. Okay, here's another quote I like, and then we'll we'll start to wrap it. <laughs> no one wants to die today. But whenever you die, it's always today. So let that mm-hmm. in, let that impact how you live your day today. You know what I'm saying? Love like it, that's man. yeah. This is this is like these simple nudges of wisdom and truth that are like, it's always gonna be today, right? And so like, let us be inspired by that fact that we have this day. Like I'm always starting out these, these podcasts, grand rising soul family. What are we going to (laughs) do? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. So, so Brandon, thank you for this inspiring conversation. I'm, I'm sure that anyone who has listened to it and gotten this far is, is taking some big inspiration and, and maybe even a little bit of like directed action into their purpose and into what their why is and maybe into who their people are. And so I love the fact that you're showing up for, uh, you know, not only your family and your immediate people and honoring them the way that you honored them through story and, but that you're showing up for your, your fellow brothers and sisters who are firefighters with that. Is there any final message you would like to leave the brothers and sisters who are listening? Thank you um, for having me here. Um, just start doing it. Start doing something. Reach out. You know, reach out to Sacred Sons. Just drop a message. Reach out to firetolight.org. Reach out to brandon.r.evans on Instagram. Hit me up at brandon at firetolight.org. Hit me up. Hit him up. I don't care. I don't <laughs> care who you are. The kindness of strangers is such a powerful tool. And the worst that can happen is someone won't respond and you'll have to do it again. But we're going to tell you that we will respond and you won't have to do it again. And we just got to figure it out one day at a time. I don't know fully how I got to where I am. Shit just happens one day after the next through taking action and recognizing this is it, right? Recognizing that I've always been taking the action when I didn't think that I was. You're not where you should be. You, you're right. You're not. You you are where you should be. Don't think you should be here or should be there. You're where you're at with whatever you've got, and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of people willing to help along the way. And so, come ask because we don't. I don't know you exist. I don't know you're there. But if you hit me up, then I'll know. Right? Then we'll know, and, and then we can help. And once we know. That's the that's the the magic. Once we know, once the light finds the light, magic happens. It's 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 true. It's a it's part of the game of this life. So if you're out there, find the light, firetolight.org. Brandon Evans, Adam Jackson, Sacred Sons. We're out, family.
Peace.